Jazzcast Pros. Welcome back to another episode of Getting Real with Bossy. Hello. How are you? I'm great. It's uh, International Women's Month. The month of women. And as you know, I have a house full of women. Um, we joke that our goldfish have to be ladies. Because I'm sure. the only man in the house is Aaron. It's me, my four daughters, my two lady cats, and my three lady goldfish. We used to have a lady dog. So yeah. Yep. It's International Women's Month, and every day is Women's Day because we rule the world, and mm-hmm. nobody really could get anything done without us, but we all know that. Right. And to celebrate, we are bringing you a very special interview with our dear friend, Imani O'Lear. Imani owns Yoga for a Good Hood and True Yoga, and she, I think, got us through the very, got bossy through the very beginning of the pandemic because we had to switch everything over to this weird platform called Zoom. We had no idea what it was. And she just would come on and do these meditations. And that was really the first time I ever really felt like I could get anything from meditation was listening to her voice. And it was one of the few times I could breathe in Mm -hmm. the early days of the pandemic. I was just sitting there. My kids would join me and we would just turn her on and just meditate. It was amazing. Yeah. The first time I heard Imani speak, we talk about it in the interview, but I literally was just like, I have to meet this woman. She was speaking at a panel and everybody was talking about how beautiful and wonderful everything was. Mm-hmm. And the panel was aimed at women hoping to own their own business someday for the most part. And I just sat there going, oh, these women are going to be in for us. <laughs> and then Imani spoke mm-hmm. and I was like, there it is. Who's that? I want to talk to her. <laughs> She was like, I don't know where you guys are coming from. And I loved it. Uh And I'm so happy that I got to meet her and that she is a part of my life now. And I wish she was a bigger part of my life because I'm obsessed with her. I always say she will always speak the truth. I don't know that she could do anything other than that. I don't think it's in her to be able to do that. She's so everything, but she's so honest. It's definitely like the true meaning of like being true and honest, which she owns True Yoga mm-hmm. and Yoga for a Good Hood. Yeah. And one of the things I love about Amani um, and what she's going to talk about today is entrepreneurship and mental health, which I so know huge. two of us don't share our struggle. I mean, we share business ownership struggles. I don't think we share our mental health struggles. Uh, we talk about therapy a lot. Mm-hmm. A r- um, riddled with anxiety and depression. <laughs> But like, that's, that's like as far as we really get into the mental health struggle of entrepreneurship. But I I looked it up and according to LinkedIn, 72% of founders battle some kind of mental health challenge. Wow. And that's only the ones admitting it. That's what I was going to say next. Mm -hmm. Part of it, because I like to look at both sides, is okay, if we didn't have these differences in this neurodiversity in whatever that challenge may be, that might be what got us to be an entrepreneur in the first place. Mm -hmm. It's like that whole outside of the box and this isn't where I fit in and I see these things that aren't happening and I want to create this new thing. So I think part of it is probably a positive. Oh, definitely. But are we all getting the help that we need to be successful both business-wise and personally? Because you need both. And you, we talk about therapy so much, and you know we are huge, huge supporters of it. But the problem solving that you learn in therapy is – I use that in business life all of the time, all the time. And, it's, and a lot of it for me is like the segmenting, like the not letting it impose on my whole life mm-hmm. and taking those moments of joy and being able to really sit in them and then taking those moments of not joy – and being able to put them where they need to go so I can get through what needs to get done today. Mm-hmm. And I think most people are good or can do that, but we have to revisit it because we still have to we have to deal with it when we can because just ignoring it is a recipe for disaster. And I've seen it too many times in myself and yes. others. So prioritizing ourselves, mm-hmm. prioritizing our mental health, and um, taking rest and self care. And unapologetically. Yes. We just had this conversation um, a couple months ago on the Facebook group, our private group, about how since the very beginning, I've always had at least two vacations scheduled. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I have to know 
that there's a point in time in a few months where I'm getting out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I am going away. And if anything, I used to tell my managers, I'm like, they'd be like, oh, I'll call you only if it burns down. And I'm like, well, honestly, what if can it you burns do? Down, I can't do anything. Right. So don't call mm-hmm. me. <laughs> but just knowing that I get to be a different version of myself and not necessarily a business owner 24 seven, right. just being a wife or just being a woman or just being my a mom and just focusing on whatever it is I want to focus that day and not have work being a part of it. Right. It's so much a part of our everyday life. If you need that separation sometime because work never really stops being work when you're, when you're home. But yep. excellent. And money's great excellent. at it. Enjoy our interview with Amani and reach out with ways that you utilize self-care and ways that you take care of your mental health at bossyrock at gmail.com, B-O-S-S-Y-R-O-C at gmail.com. We can't wait to hear from you. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Kelly. And I'm Kelly. The host of Getting Real with Bossy, the real, raw, and honest podcast about small business ownership. With our experience, nine businesses in over 25 years, we continue to bear it all and share what we wish we had known. We move past the must-be-nices and start getting real. Come along as we interview small business owners and get the true story. We're here with our good friend, Imani O'Lear, and we're so glad to have you. We've been trying to get you on for a while now. You're You're like busy, busy busiest. Too busy. Mm -hmm. The busiest. Too busy. Hoping to change that one day. Hoping to change that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So I'm going to start out with a question about being so busy because you have 50 jobs. Yes. How do you manage it all how do you take care of yourself when all of these jobs need because they're not like i don't even know what's a what's a job that doesn't require a ton of like investment i don't want all of your i know but like all of your jobs need so much from you the top three things i thought of i utilize yeah and i'm like i don't want to piss off the people that i hire right (laughs) right on yeah because i was wondering where that was going to go yeah no that's why i stopped myself and put it back on you guys you are wisdom Uh uh-huh but like how do you they're very demanding jobs and we'll get into all of what you do but is there anything that you've learned to kind of help balance it all therapy (sighs) therapy my therapist is my bff my confidant my get me right person my Mm -hmm. Did you just really say that? Mm -hmm. Or are you still doing that? Yeah, I I need that reflection back to me. That's We talk about therapy a lot and a therapy that will call out the bullshit and not just let us, you know, go on and on. That's so important. Yeah, her her main premise, shout out to Sean James, is around negative core beliefs that we hold on to Mm -hmm. and dealing with stuff that is regressed and moves through. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty much what I'm working on with my therapist. Yeah. We had to, you know, do some 15-year-old Kelly healing and some 34-year-old Kelly healing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <You> yes. <know? laughs> yes. And I'm still doing healing at 54 yeah. years mm-hmm. old. Yes. Absolutely. We're like, which, which Kelly are we going to heal today? Right. Yes. Pick an age. Yeah. Pick a decade. Pick a day. Right. But, you know, the, the one part about the, her type of therapy is – Based on a book, I can't remember the doctor's name, but it's called No Bad Parts. And so 15-year-old Kelly is not a bad Kelly. 34-year-old Kelly is not bad. Same with Imani. They serve their role. Mm -hmm. Right? But we don't have to carry them. We don't have to carry them. And they can let go of some of that also. So I I like that a lot. Yeah, it's all part. They're all just chapters in your story. Speaking of. Oh, boy. We'll get to those later. But (laughs) we have your book that my dog... Was previously enjoyed as well. Absolutely. Took a little snack off of it. <laughs> so, Amani, introduce yourself and tell us what you do. Amani uh, O'Lear. I like to call myself a urban yogi pastor mm-hmm. um, as a tagline of sorts. And so that tells you two of those gigs. I own a nonprofit called Yoga for a Good Hood, a for profit, loosely said, studio <laughs> of true yoga. As well as I am I work in the bishop's office for all things conflict and boundaries and the like and development for the ELCA. And what is the ELCA? Oh, I'm so sorry. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Good old Lutherans. And I am a pastor by trade, but I am a facilitator of leaders in this church. 
Yeah. yeah. When they're behaving badly, particularly. Right. Yeah. So just a couple. Just a couple jobs. Easy peasy jobs. So like, yeah. honestly, like a minister can't be an easy job as it is. But now not only are you doing like you have that, but you're also fixing ministers. Is that how I'm kind of like hearing Fixing this? ministers, congregations, mm-hmm. particularly around justice issues, all the social isms that they behave poorly on are when they find documents that they use to force persons of color to be baptized. Like how to address that very honestly and publicly. Do all religions have a role like this? Like you? You may not. You maybe not. Answer, maybe not. I but I know like... in the Episcopal Church mm-hmm. as well as the Lutheran Church we do. And that's kind of my DNA. My DNA is all about like how can everybody be seen? Mm-hmm. So that I think that's how I describe my jobs. I just want everybody to be seen. So I remember the first time I heard you speak, I did not know you. Okay. We went to a rock girl gang event. I think Kelly couldn't make it. Oh. And you were yeah. on the panel. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there, and most of the people in the audience didn't own businesses. They were people who wanted to own businesses, people who wanted to be entrepreneurs. You know, we're looking for that, you know, like, pull me in and and tell me all the things. And everybody on the panel was like, all the sunshine and rainbows and unicorns. And I'm just sitting there like, oh. This is not true. I mean, this is sweet. It is true, it's but it is not. sometimes. Uh-huh. But I was like, huh. And then you started talking, and you were like, I think the first thing you might have said was even along the lines of like, well, I don't know what you guys do, but, and I was like, who's this lady? Mm -hmm. I was like, I love her. And I used to say, I was like a little bit of your stalker. Like I just thought, (laughs) I was like, this woman is the most amazing person because nobody really was talking like that. Right. And then Kelly's like, well, I'm friends with her. I was like, what? You're friends with her. (laughs) Well, and then I remember you and I out to lunch at Red Fern. Yeah. And I was like. That's Amani. I'm going to introduce, introduce you. <laughs> but I was so excited. And then I found out you were a minister, and I was like, I could go to her church. Mm-hmm. I was like, I could listen to you talk about anything. Yeah. I, I think like, during I COVID was the first time I was able to really listen to you. Because I met oh. you a church in Greece, I think, when you were just starting Yoga for a Good Hood. Oh, probably. Because Lucas and I so were doing a show out there. Yeah. That was 2013 mm-hmm. for the hood. That sounds about yeah. r- right. Well, actually, maybe even before that, before that, I was like dabbling with sharing yoga before mm-hmm. I started Hood in 13. And we had done Jekyll and Hyde, Lucas and I. Oh, I knew you before that. You're right. Yeah. Oh so we've known each other for a, been, even longer. Yeah, exactly. I mean, listen, this brain and time. Yeah. Space continuum and all that. It's amazing. Yeah. But one of the things I love about getting to know you is hearing you talk about hard things In a way that is not only like in your face and honest, but it's not scary. Mm -hmm. And like, I I wish there were more people like you to go out into the community and put things in people's faces. Because I don't think that you are ever going to, I've never seen you back down from something or not talk about something because you felt like it might be uncomfortable or make somebody uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just wish there was more people like you to go out and be like, these things are hard and this is how we can address them. Right. Well, but that, you know, I think that in the tenets of white supremacy culture, it tells us not to have honest conversations or to be uncomfortable for that matter. And my thought is this whole life is uncomfortable and (laughs) weird and crazy. So why not talk about it? And if I'm just like, you know, when a teacher says to you, there's no such thing as a bad question, right? Like to get us to get our voice out there. And so we're just trying to be messy with each other. And if we can love each other through being messy, giddy up. And I think there are people that do that, but there is a level of honesty that I think when people listen to you or see you speak or read what you say, it it's just so honest. And there's people that do that for other reasons, and yours is just pure. I'm trying to be anyway, right? Like the spirit of slap comes upon me a lot of times, right? Like I I want to slap the taste out of people's mouths many times. <laughs> and I'm sure they want to slap the taste out of my mouth as well. And I just know that I'm just on this journey to try to be what I'm here to serve for, right? Like that that's it. And if that means I'm bilingual. If that means I code switch every now and then, which I know that we're not, like, that's not the top of my list of what I want to do. But if that'll have you hear me for that moment, 
so that we can get down and dirty, Mm -hmm. then I think that one of the things that the universe and God, spirit, Allah, Buddha, all that is good has given me is to be that person. We're glad that you are. I am too. And we're glad that you're in our life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it makes sense on all of the things that I know about you. Yeah. So you started talking about it. Mm-hmm. So let's go back to pre-2013. Yes. Be the, so you were already a minister at this point? Yep. 2005, I was ordained. And then you decided to open up a not-for-profit program. 2013, several years later. All right. After attending several trainings. So single mom. I wasn't married at the time. And bad credit, like be real about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> bad credit, not a lot of money. I wasn't good at managing my money and had ebbs and flows of my son's father being murdered, my daughter's father in and out of incarceration. And I needed to find some kind of peace of mind again and again and again. And so I would, I literally like wouldn't pay a bill so I can take a class. And I thought that was just ridiculous. And this is a yoga class? Yoga class. Just to have some quiet, to have a little bit of peace of mind. But then the other part that really got me, I said, oh, I want to learn more about this. Maybe I can share a little bit with a few people here and there that may be like me. And so I took one training, $3,000 later, and that was a hard lift. Mm -hmm. And then I said, other people. And so it grew into that as a nonprofit, me wanting people not to have to pay $22 to drop into one class. Yeah. I understand it's a, it's a business, but like something like yoga that can be so necessary for people. It's, it's so wonderful that you were able to meet that need because I feel like. Well, the, well, the business part of it though, was that I could then pay teachers, Mm -hmm. right? Like, because it was donation based. Right. I could gather $35 and give it to somebody who needed that $35. Mm-hmm. So in that way, it was business. <laughs> it was yoga business. Yeah. But well, People uh, always talk about not-for-profits like mm-hmm. they're not business. Right. Or for-profits like they are business. Mm-hmm. But it's just how your taxes are looked at. Right. It has nothing to do – like they're businesses. Right. Yes. Absolutely. And the IRS likes to also always get their money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yes, they do. Mm-hmm. They always get their money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was 2013 when you officially started, but you were doing it a little bit before that. Yeah. And and that was only because we wanted to apply for grants. Right. Otherwise, and what I'm seeing now in hindsight is that I I would have never have organized the nonprofit just for grants sake. Right. Because then you lose some of that freedom that you once had in that world because you're dictated by those... Right. Like I have a meeting with the an organization that granted us some money and I didn't meet those deliverables. Mm -hmm. That is anxiety producing. Sure. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that led into purchasing True. And when when was that? Oh, Right, right before that global was, pandemic. That was four months uh-huh. before the pandemic. Yeah. My husband and I, who have no business knowledge at that time whatsoever, made the decision to be the third owners of True Yoga and do a build out and move the business diagonally so we didn't have to hire movers. <laughs> We literally so carried never, stuff across the street. Right. You were never open in the orig- the other space. No. It's a beautiful space. It's a beautiful space. The build-out was gorgeous. Gorgeous spot. The struggle is we don't own that building. Mm-hmm. Rent is what rent is. And as you think about, like, from a business standpoint, we, did, we thought once the build-out was paid that we would gain a little bit of space in that. Yeah. And we didn't. Because um, in the pandemic, everything skyrocketed. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so at that time, we pivoted quite quickly because I had some sense in my heart that I wanted to broadcast to capture that market of sorts for right. the for profit. Or what I started recognizing after we purchased it that persons of color didn't also feel safe 
to come into the studio yet, even if it was owned by a black woman. Right. And so we wanted to broadcast that out. So we already had bought the stuff to broadcast, but that faithful week of shutdown, mm-hmm. we like not knowing any of this, how to do it. We just, we were Zooming yoga classes just so that we can continue to pay the bills. Right. I know. I took it. I took it. Mm -hmm. Right on. I couldn't do it very often because I had four kids at home. Kind of ruins yoga for you. But when I could, I did. Yes. Yes. And And some of your meditations. I was going to say, we switched Bossy to that same model quickly as well because we still needed to find a way for us all to get together and talk and support each other. And I remember you were on several of them doing five, ten-minute meditations, which are so important. We need it, right? Mm-hmm. Like to, to catch our breath, you know. All, for me, at least, I know being a business owner, my parasympathetic nervous system is out of control mm-hmm. and it's screaming. I almost banged the table, Kelly. That's okay. I <laughs> it's fine. Uh, <laughs> but like my my mm-hmm. nervous system uh, just shouts and it's, it's terrifying. Mm-hmm. It's terrifying that we invested money, like that we didn't have. My husband's a teacher. Right. Pastor. Like... I'm, and I'm not, I've never been a pastor of like some mega church, right. make a hundred thousand, I know they probably even make more than that, a hundred thousand dollars a year. It was none of that. And so we just took out of our retirement to purchase this business. And so it was scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I assume still is because I'm 13 years in and I'm terrified. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm so scared. I'm also scared for the community, though. Because I think about, like, what if I couldn't do this anymore, right? Because I started it for the good of the community, we kept rates a certain level so we could always pay our staff, but also not tax folks too terribly. And then I go, what if I am, like, I'm 54. Like, what if? Right. And that's such a horrible pressure because you you are free to be done when you're ready to be done. That is your right, and you deserve it. You've worked really hard for a long time and made huge contributions to this community, and life-changing moments happen because of you. You deserve to be able to step away, and that pressure has got to be huge. But that's not for you to you're feel like... you me cry, Kelly. I know. You don't have to carry <laughs> that, though. But, I mean, that's got to be a huge concern. Like, what... Mm-hmm. Who steps in? It really is. I mean, you know, we, um, you know, with the studio and the hood, you know, we offer. Oh, I just made myself cry. We've, tr- we have. <laughs> I'll see her crying in the corner. <laughs> we have trained over 75 people that would not have access to a $3,000 training that can go out and work at the yoga studios, make a little side hustle, or make a full hustle Mm -hmm. with it. And I'm very proud of that, but the pressure of that. And some of it helped me is because I also know that people's nervous systems are at a higher level and uh, they're radiating at a lower vibration right now. And like this need to want to be a part of that healing with others makes my parasympathetic nervous system go off the chain and this sense of service that I've been taught and lived out I sometimes forget that I need to be to service of my own self Mm -hmm. because when I start thinking about the spirit of slap right if I'm thinking that every day that's telling me something right yeah so you're absolutely correct and it's it's not just the community, but like it's your employees and the the people that rely on you. And you're like, well, what happens if I close down? You know, yeah, people are going to find a place to eat. People are going right. to find a place to do yoga. But like, what happens to those people who are relying on me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What happens? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not like we're their main bread and butter, but for some of them, it's, it's their bread. <laughs> right. 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 But some of where we're getting the bulk of our money isn't meeting that that's meeting the financial need. Yes. I would imagine people that are working for you are getting even if it's a small part of their weekly, monthly yeah. money, they're getting a lot more met than and they I, might be getting at other jobs too. And I do think one of the unique things about 
that I really love about True is that it is a community. Like I watch the text threads of them <laughs> talking all the time. I'm like, oh dear God, they're, oh my gosh. But they're each other's family mm-hmm. and support each other. If like w- even when my cousin died uh, about a month, like they just poured love over me or when another staff member's mother passed away, like it is a good community, but it also for me has become an exhausting community and and when it becomes exhausting, I am now asking myself, is that still of service? Right. Yeah. And like we started from the very beginning of this conversation, we were talking about how we have to take care of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when we give and 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 we give. And I think that there's definitely, like you you say it very scientifically, with the nervous systems and the <laughs> vibrations and the post it. I just call it collective trauma. Like the entire oh. world mm-hmm. went through this collective trauma. Yes. And it's fucking exhausting and for those of us who already have very high stress jobs we're coming out of it and we're like Mm -hmm. how do i not do this anymore right Right. like i'm not putting extra things on my plate i'm not giving things away when i'm not getting paid i'm not putting my emotional sanity on the line yeah and then like you get pulled in because you have to there's Mm -hmm. certain things you just can't not do right you're like oh i want to lay in bed and watch a movie all day today and cry but I have meetings and I got to do payroll and I, my staff wants to know what's going on and they need me to pick up this and we're out of this. And I got, you know, I got this email that blah, blah, blah. And then you're even more exhausted and you start right. the next day. Yep. And I, what I have found that I know is not fair to the staff at True in the Hood, I'm not even present for that anymore. Like, right? Like I, or teaching, like I, I'm not even present. And so I, I have some lament around that. I can't, I can't show up for them right. as they try to show up for me. And that just seems silly. <laughs> well, and not on the same level at all, but I used to always say about my time at Hillside, like, I love my job every morning. I don't love it every afternoon. Mm-hmm. But, like, when that moment changes, that's when I know it's time to go. Because if I can't give them my best, I got to get somebody else in there. And that was when I remember the day it happened. And I looked at Don and I was like, yeah, I think it's time. Like, I love it, and I love what I'm doing, and I think it, I'm providing a service, but it's not – it's no longer working for me. And yeah. I think that's a hard thing to do as business – especially small business owners is recognizing when that moment happens because staying too long could really – do it's a like lot of damage. Season seven, where the producers are just making right. shit up. Yeah, like we jumped the shark. <laughs> like, years how many ago. Rockies have we seen? Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be in a mistake baby soon. Mm-hmm. What's right. what's going to get thrown? As soon as the mistake baby comes in, we're all out. Right. <laughs> well, that's. Um, I make jokes about the book, but like the opening part of it says a quote out of A Course in Miracles, and it is nothing real can be threatened. Herein lies the peace of God. That quote sustains me, not only in the work, but I know in my core that nothing real can be threatened. And the only thing that is real is the absolute sense of love. But like, it's still hard for that other self that's saying that you failed if you give this up. Give all of yourself blood sweat and tears, right? Like that's also singing in my ear at the same time. So I'm trying to hold that truth so it doesn't do greater harm. Right. What are other people going to say? What are my staff mm-hmm. going to say? What are the guests going to say? Or even what's the community going to say? What the community going to say? Like, and that's probably a bigger driver for me because as I've started having conversations, one of the conversations is, is it time for me to stop? Right. Is it time for me to stop? with the yoga studio and the nonprofit is that time. And the big conversation for me is how will the community, what will the community feel about or think of or say of me Mm -hmm. and coming to like, it's not like I don't care by no means because I love them, but also at the same time, I know what is true and I have to hold on to that. Mm Mm-hmm. And it can't define you. We talked no. about this a little bit in the group that it doesn't – and I, I, in my own head, I have two brains, right? It's like you failed all the things I've closed. You failed. It was horrible. You wasted money, blah, blah, blah. When I'm actually – I know 
some of the things it wasn't the right time. Some of the things I should have done a little bit differently. Some of the things ran their course. Right. Yep. And that's okay. And that's okay. Things run their course. Things can't be around forever. And you can't keep it going. If somebody else cares that much, they can pick it up Mm -hmm. and they can take it. Amen. That'll preach, so to speak. (laughs) Right? And it's hard to say that to yourself because it's your passion and it's your love and it's your, you put so many hours into it and we think about it constantly and getting to a point where it's okay to be like, you know what? If somebody wanted to take it on or if I'm not, you know, paying myself by X month or ever. This is it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, I think yeah. it's hard to tell ourselves that we can still be successful. We are still business owners. We are mm-hmm. still community members. We are still the things that we did still happened. Yes. And the changes we made in the world still happened and the people we affected still happened because mm-hmm. of us. Yeah. Right. Even if we decide that it's time to move on to something else. And that's really hard as a business owner. A part of my thinking also has been around people are so different now. And is it yoga from that standpoint, what is needed? Maybe mm-hmm. it's a different thing. or And, and I think that's somebody else's vision. Mm-hmm. It's not mine. My son said, maybe this is just giving you more space, mom, to do something for you. Mm-hmm. Right? Because I don't think I've ever done that. I said to my therapist, I said, I don't know who I would be if I don't, if I'm not doing all the things. But I do know I'm tired of people saying to me, oh, you do all the things. And that is my identity Mm -hmm. versus Amani. Right. So that's one of our favorite questions to ask lately is how do you define yourself versus how the world defines you? And I think this is a good time for that question. Mm. In my truest sense, there is a Kwanzaa principle. One of the Naguza Sabas is Kuji Chakalia, K-U-J-I-C-H-A-G-U-L-I-A. For if you want to look it up if somebody's listening. But <laughs> Kuji Chakalia is self-determination. I name myself for me. I was born Kimberly Elizabeth. That was my birth name. Really? I yep. just learned something. Me too. And Kimberly Elizabeth also did some stripping and <laughs> tripping, let's just say. <laughs> <laughs> and as I was going down my yeah. own spiritual journey, my father started calling me Amani, which means faith. And he just kept calling me that. And it stuck. And he, we went through a na- renaming ceremony in an Afrocentric tradition, and he named me, and I was like 28 years old, and my, he na- renamed me Amani Nedhari, which means faith in the vision. That is so sweet. Yeah. So I, I, I look at my ancestor altar and go, I am Amani Nedhari. I am joy. Yes, Kim is there if you want to go at it. But naming myself is is important. And so I always go back to the roots of my ethnicity, my my roots of my my birth origin. I even go through the trauma that my mother went through with her mental health. Like that is all running through, but coursing through my veins as well. That's how I do it. Look back at my ancestors. Your eyes are getting a little glistening too. Stop it. I don't cry on these things. I cry all the time. I do feel very at peace though. And every time, like I was saying earlier, every time you speak, I'm just like, oh, every, all is better in the world because Amani's here. I wish all was better in the world just because I was here because, Lord, don't we need it, <laughs> right? I wouldn't have to have a shirt on that says I'm- Oh, can you stand up a yeah. little bit so we could see the whole oh. shirt? <laughs> For those of you listening, it says pro-black, pro-brown, pro-queer, pro-trans, pro-science, pro-choice, pro-ho. Pro-ho. Pro-ho is actually kind of hard to say once you get through the whole list. Pro-ho. Pro-ho. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I... I do a lot of what I do because mm-hmm. I'm pro all those things. Right. So the world is seeing you as the doer of all. And yeah. You are, so but taking it literally just back to this is my name. This is my name. Mm-hmm. And like, this is hard work. Mm-hmm. Living and yeah. being human. I would guess that if you do need a break from doing all the things, there will come a time where you find something else that you need to do that is going to be Equally important, if not more. So, you know what I like to do? Yeah, tell me. Hike 
Yeah, the Appalachian Trail. Oh, I have a, I have a hiker who wants to go with you. <laughs> several mm-hmm. days at a time, camp and do that, or some kind of North Pacific Rim or something. Just uh, isolated. We don't have to talk mm-hmm. and walk. My aunt just did that in Iceland. Really? She hiked Iceland for like five days. There's like a group you can go with and yes, you've got is. to carry everything on your back mm-hmm. and you are in it. Yes. And they hiked Iceland. Yes. That's oh, amazing. That. She mm-hmm. was not happy once she got there <laughs> and like halfway through it, but she was very happy she did it because she mm-hmm. was 60. So she did it because she turned 60. She's like, I'm going to hike Iceland. And then she was like, what the hell did I get myself mm-hmm. I wouldn't hike Iceland. <laughs> Well, that's what Dot every I time know, that it's much different than doing the Appalachian Trail well, or the Pacific Parts Ram. of, yeah. yeah. There's yeah. there's parts that are easier than others. Yeah, but exactly. Don says that all the time. Like, it is such a nightmare. I hate it. And then all of a sudden, they're at the top of a high peak, and he's just like, it's worth every every bitch, every moan, every cracked rib, every yeah. sprained ankle. Yeah. And there is something about being in the woods. Just yes. being outside. Mm-hmm. And once you get, like, into a trail, like, even we live in the same neighborhood, just going back there and going into the trails, like... You just stop hearing the rest of the world. It's different than taking a walk. Yes. Because, like, the world is there. Yeah. Which, growing up in the 80s, I don't do the trails by myself. We've right. talked about this before. Oh. My husband takes jogs with the trails all the time. <laughs> oh. I am not looking to die. No. I don't. <laughs> so many different ways. No. You, 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 I have so much har- arsenal on me when I'm on a trail. <laughs> Let's just say that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So. But I do love being in the trails if there's someone with me so I don't feel like I'm going to die all these awful ways. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you just, as soon as the parking lot goes away, I feel like the world kind of goes away and you just get to breathe the oxygen and hear yeah. the birds mm-hmm. and feel the peace. That's my goal. Which you honestly could turn into a business at some point where you do these group-led, nobody talk to each other, hiking expeditions and get people out of... It has been a thought. Yeah. My therapist tried to tell me, try not to go right into doing another thing Mm -hmm. because I'm good at just doing another thing. Yeah. Right. You have a free hour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why not? (laughs) Yeah, let me squeeze that in. How long? I mean, how many hours a week does it take to sit on this board? Like, we can do it. We can do that. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's part of the entrepreneurial Mm -hmm. cycle. Right. Is that we don't know how to stop creating. Even for ourselves. Like, what if we just did more creating for ourselves Mm -hmm. also? Like, time of rest. Like, I thought that's what owning a yoga studio would be. I would be doing yoga every day. That I would. So centered. Oh, my gosh. Nirvana. Uh Like, it would be beautiful and all would be well in the world. Nope. You're running a business. I'm running a business. Mm -hmm. I get on my mat in the yoga studio. I hear the guy come in off the street. Where's my red, red, red? I'm going. Mm-hmm. So there's no like. Right. So that's the. We'll see what happens. But first, do it for yourself. But first, for myself. Mm-hmm. First, hike both the Appalachian Trail and the Pacific Rim, and then you can do anything you want. First. Yep. Kuji Chakalia <laughs> first. Kuji Chakalia. Kuji Chakalia. I've been practicing saying that because we do uh, Kwanzaa with Amani. Yes. Different Amani. <laughs> yes. Different Amani. <laughs> But you can come over for Kwanzaa, for our caramu. When we have our caramu, you're welcome to come over. Thank you. But Kuji Chakalia is one of my favorite ones to say. Because yes. every year I'm like, how do I say that again? Because I don't want to screw it up. Yep. Right. Hiking the Appalachian Trail. Don's going to be so excited. <laughs> He's a great wanna, hiking partner. Does she want to go yeah. with Don? He won't talk to you. No, I, I, I believe and that. And I have an entire back basement because this is the same size that way that is just filled with camping equipment. Oh, so, I think he told me Please never that. buy anything. Never buy anything because we have it. But I really do like buying camping equipment. That's that's probably another reason why I don't need to like justify because I go, oh, that's fitness stuff. I can write that off. Don't do it. No. Don't do it. It's like that Schitt's Creek uh, meme. <laughs> it's a write-off. It's a write-off. It's a write-off. Do you I got to try means? these sheets out. <laughs> right. You can't sell them without trying <laughs> right. them. Right. You just write it off. <laughs> It's like free. Mm -hmm. So you have been breaking barriers since when? Like when's the earliest barrier you can remember? Because you just told us so many stories and are doing things that I don't think anyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. Oh, Did you just come out breaking barriers? Were you just like, how? Oh, I don't know. We said we were going to talk about vaginas and look, here we are. Here Here we we are, are. breaking barriers. Coming out, breaking barriers. I mean, maybe. 
I mean, there's stories about me growing up, you know, me telling my papa, who was a preacher, hurry up and stop. I want to go home <laughs> from wherever I was sitting. Oh. <laughs> And he would stop. He, as the story goes, my grandfather, Reverend John Dallas Jenkins, who is now an ancestor, he would go, well, my granddaughter told me that it's time to wrap it up. So I guess we're going to wrap it up. So maybe that is like what comes to mind. Okay. But I like a good underdog, so to speak. I like rooting. Like I, I root for the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> In a Bill's household, <laughs> it's it's a hard life some mm-hmm. days. But I think that a part of who I am called to be as the fourth child, my mother struggled with mental illness and schizophrenia was one of her, her top three. And she had a hallucination one day and she threw me down a flight of steps. And my auntie, she said, hey, catch. And she turns and looks as she's throwing me a baby down the steps and my auntie catches me. Now, I don't know this story, like personally. Right. Mm-hmm. But, you know, people are like, oh, my gosh, your mother tried to harm you. I'm like, my mother didn't try to harm me. My mother thought I was a basket of, gro- of, right. of, of clothes or something like that, possibly. But I tell those kind of stories about my mother because she couldn't. And there's something about my life here, I think. Is that so that the queer or those that are struggling through whatever the stuff is that I can say it now? Sometimes, much to my father's chagrin, as I was raised, he would go, "Somebody's going to kill you for saying the things you say. You need to stop." And I, I would always go, Phew. but as an adult, my father lived through King's assassination, mm-hmm. Malcolm X's assassination. And as a woman, I know that sometimes that has to be measured. So maybe, yeah, I have always, because they've always been like, oh, dear God. Oh, goodness. Oh, you remember that time, Monty Mon, I had to pull a gun out on somebody because you opened your mouth? I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> right? That's why my husband doesn't like me to wear this shirt, because he doesn't want anyone to say anything to me. Or when Daniel Prude, after his murder and those protests here in Rochester, like, There were times my husband, who was white, that's important to the story, listeners, he had to infiltrate a group, so to speak, to tell us if harm would come that night. Uh Right? And that's why he worries. Because I am going to always speak up. And honestly, to have the audacity as I'm imagining you to be three or four years old in church. (laughs) I grew up going to church. I would have loved to have said that. Mm -hmm. And I was a pretty outspoken kid. Like, (laughs) and it's your grandfather. So, like, in my opinion of this story, I'm like, well, it all makes sense now. Because if she had it in her at that age to be like, yo, shut up. All of us want to go home. We're hungry. But but let me just say, though, (laughs) I don't always speak up. And it does. My biggest heartbreak with this work is when I'm accused of something (laughs) that I didn't do. Because I know what I try to do. And I don't always speak up for myself in those kind of moments. It's easier to speak up for other people. Yeah. And that that's one of the things that I want to stop <laughs> doing, you know? I want to stop not speaking up for myself. Like, that goes all to the self-care. I will speak up, but not for myself. And there's been some nasty people. Well, you're a business owner, so that puts you in a different place. You're black. Mm-hmm. You're a woman. Mm-hmm. So you're just like, and you're outspoken. Yeah. So you literally have like all the strikes against you. Yep. So society thinks they can just do whatever. I think that's the difficult part for me. Like I want to be able to say when someone says something to me that is untrue to go, I don't know who you think you're talking to, but let them come up and try to hit you. Right. I'm going to be ready to fight all the more. Pull out my baton and go from there. It's exhausting though to carry all of that. Back to what we talked about uh-huh. half an hour ago. Yeah. Like we're carrying so much and you're carrying so much more. It is exhausting. And, I'm, and I know I'm tired now. I thought that would be a sign of weakness to say that I'm tired because that's also what we're indoctrinated into, to always grind, 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 grind. Well, we grind, but so far, right? <laughs> and you're nothing but dust. And then you're right back to where you started as dust. Yep. <laughs> 
George. George needs some love. George uh. is like, you guys are getting really serious. <laughs> Pet a cat. <laughs> Come here. We're okay. Not serious or anything. That was just like. Yeah. Huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think it's important. Like, when do you know it's time to say I need a break? I, yeah. I'm, I am tired and I'm done. Mm-hmm. And it's usually <laughs> six months after. Right. You yeah, right. probably should have, so to speak. Right, because it's always okay to say that. That's not, I guess I said that wrong. No, you didn't no, say it wrong. No, the time. You didn't say it wrong. Right, but like it's always the time to do that because there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, I think, hard for us. We've been taught not to do it. Right. Yes. We have been told, you got to keep on keeping on. Mm-hmm. Pull your boots up and yep. do the darn thing. Right. And, and as women, oh, I... Remember that commercial? I could bring home the bacon dun, dun, and mm-hmm. then fry it up in a pan. Yep. And then she has to say, and then make you feel like a man. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, don't stop. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. We talk about that a lot, like how it's like, okay, well, now I'm doing well in this, but now my marriage is getting ignored. Or like, I'm doing this, but now then I'm worried if I'm not supporting my spouse in the right way or, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like, you can't, you, there's so many balls in the air. All the balls. All the balls. And they don't <laughs> All always the have to be in the air. Mm-hmm. No. Just let them fucking drop. Yeah. I know that we have a little bit of a similarity, though different. Recently got diagnosed with fibromyalgia and mm-hmm. it was part of me, I think, got to the, my body was just done. Like I just got days where I just couldn't even get up. Yeah. And I would still work. I would work from bed because God mm-hmm. forbid the work doesn't get done. Right. But I didn't – I couldn't get out. Yeah. And it was almost freeing that it made me stop. Right. Because now you had a legitimate excuse yeah. to be tired. Yep. Because I would fight – I fought through ourselves. it for so many yep. years and was like, mm-hmm. just have to keep going. Drink more coffee. Just, just got to go. Just got to go. Just got to go. And then it was like, oh, I can't today. Like, I literally cannot. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, oh, thank God. Right. I, I finally am being forced to stop. Yep. I said to my therapist out loud, and sometimes I measure what I say to my therapist. I'm going to be completely honest. <laughs> we all do. Right. I'm like, I don't know if she's going to handle it. But I was just kind of spitball, and I said, well, the only time I get a break is if I go to into the hospital. Mm-hmm. And she was like, is that what you use the hospital for? I said, Yes, Maybe. Sometimes. And you might not even be doing it intent. Like, it's just. <sighs> right. Your body. It's all connected. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you just have to shut down sometimes because right. we're not giving ourselves those moments. Yeah. yeah. We shouldn't need fibromyalgia yeah. or a trip to the hospital or a brain injury exactly. to be able to say, no, I'm just not going to do it. I'm just yeah. di- I'm tired and done. Yeah. For Absolutely. as long as I need to be. Mm-hmm. That's right. It's insanity. Yeah. I mean, and the interesting thing for me, like I think about. Like I have, um, you know, because I'm a pastor also, you know, you get that, the weird Christian-y stuff. Well, just pray away your mm-hmm. t- illness and do it all for God. You make weirdness. me want to go to your church. I, I'm, you if you I was still in church, <laughs> it's so toxic and it is driving all of us to the point of, oh gosh, like atrophy. Mm-hmm. Yeah towards everything and that's where I'm starting to feel and I'm like nope I want to feel I want to feel the pain I want to I want to feel the joy I don't want to tap out right it's like bad relationships like like I'm not mad anymore I just don't really feel anything right that's the point like you can't get to that point I think so many of us are there and Mm -hmm. we're like living that yeah just keep going and not feeling the great or the bad yeah I mean, even at, you know, with True, you know, the yoga studio, you know, my husband and I are having active conversations around selling it because I can't, I can't do it and I don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. That is the truth. But also I now am kind of like, "Mm." oh, there was a day that I would have given my left arm before I sold my business. Mm hmm. I don't know many business owners that wouldn't leave for the right money or any money. Mm-hmm. I yeah. think that uh, this, I think the pandemic has changed that a lot. I know that like, I think we always need Marshall street. I think Don emotionally needs mm-hmm. to always have that, but we almost sold the union this year like this. That is something that could happen again. 
I would love for my general manager, I say that because I know she listens to these, <laughs> would love to pass this on to her someday because I love what she's doing with our our collective dream. Yeah. But I just, yeah. I, there is, I always say, some of my favorite stories, stories are short stories. They do not all have to be novels. These, everything we do does not have to be. Quote, yes, that is a t-shirt. I don't think I made it up. I probably heard it somewhere, but. But we're taught to, to long mm-hmm. suffer. Right. <laughs> and like, that's a badge of honor. Right. Like, that's a badge of stupidity. Yeah. No more. No. Ripping that badge off. Yeah. yeah. You'll have to make some bossy suffer. badges. Yeah. Every time you like make a decision that's actively for your mental health, you're gonna get a badge. Get a badge. Ooh. Ooh. Can we get a sash like mm-hmm. the brown? Yes. Yeah. The brownies. Mm-hmm. Oh, they ours will be blue. Yeah. Ooh. That like yes. tealish blue of bossy. I don't know that it's blue. Forgot I was. Might not be a sash though. I feel like we might. It might be. Ooh, like pink lady va- yeah. jackets. Mm-hmm. And we get like patches. Mm-hmm. Yeah. True fact. On my way here, I stopped at a state sale. They had a pink lady jacket for sale. <laughs> That I meant to be. Bought. So there mm-hmm. you go. Yep. There it all came together, universe. Thank you. <laughs> our badges of honor are mm-hmm. doing shit for ourselves. I'm going to start working on this. This is going to be my new business. <laughs> there you go. We'll just yeah. buy well, I have the back. cricket, so I always oh, I need the cricket. Re- the cricket. <laughs> She's got a cricket. Mm-hmm. Which I am now actually making money off of, so I awesome. feel like I finally got my investment back. Okay. Yeah, we've been making all of our own, like, swag. Oh, I love that. It's so easy. And I found, like, Amazon. There's Amazon Business now. And there's this new site that I just found where I got, like... We are not sponsored by Amazon, but would be. Yeah, for sure. Yes. Always. All of us. Definitely. But I got sweatshirts for, like, two ninety eight a piece. <laughs> I'll take what? it. What? Two like, ninety eight a piece? Yeah. For sweatshirts. Yeah. And they're decent. I mean, they're not, like... Right. The fanciest. You, the softest Hanes out you, there, but... You, you sell it for $5, you right. make a profit. <laughs> exactly. So... I probably shouldn't have said that since I'm not selling them for five dollars. But oh no, either but, way, mm-hmm. either way, we gotta yeah, make yeah, pandemic just... money back somehow, right? Well, oh. then there's that, right? Like, and then when we look, we pull five years of profit loss, and we were we were surprised that it, you know, what balanced itself out. But I was grateful for that PPP money at mm-hmm. that time. Lord have mercy. Yeah, and thank y'all for walking us through that. You're welcome. We all needed to do it. Yes. Oh, it was a scary time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very. So you wrote a book. <laughs> At what part of this journey? We haven't even talked about your book. How far into this recording? Well, are we? I know you both have places to be in 20 minutes. So. 20 minutes. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You know, so I, I went to a, uh, what's that, psychic. She told me to write a book. And I was like, I'm not writing a book. I hate writing. <laughs> I I don't have anything to say. And I I went through school during a time that sentence structure stuff was not always, you know, my gift. So anyway, and so I said, no, absolutely not. But at the same time, I was moving through not only yoga world, studying A Course in Miracles, which is basically a narrative alongside of the next chapter of the Bible of sorts. That's essentially Mm -hmm. that she received this vision of that book. And that opening line that I mentioned is from A Course in Miracles, which is, nothing real can be threatened. And what I wanted to talk about was who I am as a person. All the stuff I've done, thought about doing, things people didn't know about me, I'm still a being of love. It doesn't matter. So I wanted to get that out there and to have people to like maybe look at whether I was a single mother, whether I was a stripper, whatever it was in my life, that they could go, oh, right? So this is just like a great big testimony book, basically. You defined yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Your true True identity. identity. Yeah. Where can we find your book? Only on Amazon and... (laughs) Some in my basement, maybe. I don't know. (laughs) I'd loan mine out, but you have to read around. <laughs> I'm a dog, but I don't know. You know, so what was interesting lesson for me about this book? So there's a couple of reviews of the book, and the book pointed out what I pointed out, which was if you like Zora Neale Hurston, which writes in dialect, mm-hmm. you can move through my book. <laughs> Let's just say that my sentence structuring and this person ate me alive on that review. 
And so I get really nervous about that because everyone, if you're not expecting, I guess, poor writing, if that's the, I know that is a white supremacist, like, mm-hmm. ideal. I Because that is one of the tenets, worship over the written word. At the same time, again, that's where I, like, I try to move in both of those worlds. I understand that, that if that's what you're expecting, don't read the book. Right. Right. You can get all you need to know about me. Just have have a conversation with me. I'll tell you whatever you want, though. Right. But that was a lesson of me trying to be brave and speak my voice. And you did. I did. And I think that that whole, like, grammar thing's all bullshit. Right. Oh, yeah, I do. I think that there is nothing wrong with writing how you speak. Uh Uh-huh. Yes. If I can speak this way to you without getting spoken down to, why can't I write it down this way? Yeah, if you want to hear my story, hear yeah. it how I speak. Yes. I'm not trying to write a textbook. Right. Yes. Which even that, maybe kids would like them better if they were wrote more <laughs> right? conversationally. Yes. So that's the hope anyway. Yeah. But yeah, so I wrote that probably now, oh gosh, I guess it's like eight, eight, ten years ago. Yeah. Goodness. You're yeah. different Amani now. A little bit, but a lot of bit still there. But what what is different, I would say from there, there was um, trying to put a pin in a moment. And I'm now realizing there is no such thing. Right. Yeah, it's very fluid. All right. I think that that is the most perfect way to possibly end a conversation with you. Right on. Because I feel like every time I talk to you, I'm putting like a pin in a moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. This is fun. And sharing all your stuff. I got some stuff. Yeah, and I look forward to the second one and the third one because I think we would love to check in with you often. We'll have to have an, an update with Amani at the bar. Yeah. We're do more bar podcasts. Yes. She's got this beautiful bar over here. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, giddy up. Yeah. I want to be on that one. Right? Mm-hmm. Yes. All right. We Thank always do them in so the morning, much. and I'm like, oh, we should do them at the bar. Yeah. <laughs> When we get that. those cameras from our next sponsor. Yes, from our Amazon yeah, sponsor. Our Amazon sponsor. We can be wherever we want. So okay. how do we reach you? How do we find you for people that want to follow you? Because you do have a – when you post, your posts are amazing. Oh, uh, True Yoga, T-R-U, Yoga Rochester, for everything. Or Be True Yoga for the website. Yes. So, yeah, that's us. So B-E-T-R-U? Yes. Be True I love that woman. Like we were saying earlier, how honest she is, and she couldn't possibly not be honest. And she will never stop fighting for what is right, no matter what. Even if, you know, her husband is doing his best to drag her back, she just won't. She will not stop. And her commitment to inclusivity is it's all a part of her. And she is, she's, we, everyone in this world could learn something from Imani. Honestly, I'm not a religious person, and it makes me want to go to church, but only her church. Like, I just want to hear her preach. I, that's one of the things I was able to do during the pandemic. I am not a Lutheran, and I'm not religious either, but I would just sit and listen to those. Just sit back and listen. A, her voice is just so soothing and calming. Yes. She can yeah. have her own business just talking and, like, having people pay her to listen to her. Like, I'm like, I'll listen to anything she has to say. That could be something she gets into at some point, really doing some meditation and you could really, she is, you could just listen to her forever. I love her. And I know it's a, a cultural thing and it's an African thing, but she um, talks a lot. If you follow her on social media about her ancestry and carrying that mm-hmm. with her. And I've kind of implemented some of that into my own life of like in those moments where I need to meditate or I'm having a really hard time. I find myself talking to my ancestors and asking for their support and being like, I'm trying to be this strong woman and I'm trying to do all the right things. And I need the strong women for me to like come and help me in this moment. And I I learned that from her um, because in my culture, that's not something we really talk about. Right. And I find it really beneficial. And I am still sitting in naming yourself. Mm -hmm. When we asked her that question, I did not expect that answer. Right. And the power of defining who you are. Like I still, I still find myself thinking about it. Like it really pops into my head. And she legitimately defined who she is. Absolutely. (laughs) Literally. But you could also figuratively um, 
to find that. So I'm hoping that by the end of 2024, I am a little bit better at defining who I am and the power that sits behind that. Absolutely. This is this is one interview I feel like I'm going to go back and listen to many times. A thousand times. And we could have her on six more times and we would have plenty to talk about because there's so much about her that we didn't even get into. So she's another one to revisit at some point. Definitely. Excellent. Mm-hmm. All right. Be bold. Be brave. Be the boss.